but when I first started, it was like, uh, I was working with a Canadian label and they kind of like, she's like Brandy Spears. She's black, but she's, she's pop, you know, Brandy Spears. And I, I didn't want to be categorized like that. Like, I just was like, I'm me and, and I don't make any sense and that's fine. You know, I'm different. This is all about the same. Welcome to the 123rd episode of All About the Song. I am your host, Michael McDonnell, and thank you for joining us. On the podcast today, we have Fifi Dobson. I was so glad to talk to Fifi. It was a great conversation. We talk about her getting into music. We talk about, you know, uh, growing up, getting into music, songwriting, her initial success, being on the Justified tour. It was a it was a really enjoyable conversation. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. And to be quite honest, we kind of only scratched the surface with Fifi's story thus far. So we are going to do more episodes and hopefully the next one will be in person. But I was really glad to get the opportunity to talk to Fifi and see what she was up to today. She hinted at a new album. So hopefully we'll be hearing something from her soon. And she was also part of Artist Can, who re-recorded the Bill Withers song, Lean On Me. All the money for that song that it makes is going to the Red Cross uh, in support of COVID-19. Danny Reiner, Tyler Shaw, and Fifi Dobson were the brainchild behind this massive project that included Brian Adams, Justin Bieber, Michael Buble, to name a small few of the people that were all involved in the project. Now, if you like all about this song, we're on audio and video. And if you're watching on video right now, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification button so that you are aware of every podcast that we put out. And they're always on Tuesdays. If you're listening to audio, be sure to rate and subscribe as well. And now a quick word from our friends and sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Hailed which is a coffee shop located at Young and Girard in downtown Toronto area. If you are a coffee drinker, you must try Hailed. They are ranked consistently among the top 10 coffee houses in Toronto. Visit the store and support local Toronto-based businesses. Be sure to place your order at www.hailed.ca. This episode is also brought to you by Flickly. Thank you, Richard Atkin, friend of the podcast. We really appreciate your support for the Canadian music scene. Rich is the founder and CEO of Flickly, a premier video animation studio, working with large brands and enterprises across the globe. Learn more about Rich and his work at Flickly by going to the website, flickly.com, F-L-I-K-L-I.com, and connect with Richard Atkin on LinkedIn. So here we are, episode 123 of All About the Song, featuring Fifi Dobson. All right, well, Fifi, thanks so much for being on the podcast. I'm really glad that we got to do this. You're actually someone that's been on my wish list, I think, since like the beginning. Uh, I remember talking to Danny, and he was mentioning how great you would be as a guest, and it's been uh, something that I'm really glad that we're we're doing. So yeah. How have you been dealing with the pandemic? What's your 2020, I guess the beginning of 2021, been like? Uh, 2021's been pretty it actually has been pretty busy um, just because I've been recording and I have like my own little setup at the house where I've been um, recording vocals and writing and doing Zoom sessions, basically. Right. So um, that's kept me busy. Uh, but I'm in Nashville, so it's we're not on like full lockdown out here. Um, we have a curfew, but we're not on on full lockdown. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I mean, it's good for sure, but I'm sure, 
I'm sure maybe we should be on full, <laughs> full lockdown. <laughs> well, so I wanted to, I mean, how is Nashville? Like, is it, is it normal? Is it a little bit different or kind of everything's the same? Uh, in what sense? Just like restaurants, people walking around. Like kind of oh, what's, the, like what's the temperature land? like? Um, you mean like during this time, like during COVID? Yeah. Um, it's been, uh, at first it was, well, I was in Europe when, um, when it all went down, like when it was first, like you got to get back into the States or you can't get back in the States. And so, um, when we got back to Nashville, uh, it was pretty crazy because we had to do the quarantine for 14 days and just to be safe. And again, there was no toilet paper here. It was insane. There was barely anything on the shelves in Kroger or any of the uh, grocery stores. We packed up on like, I had so much stuff in my pantry that it was ridiculous. Like, I think I had like maybe 40 cans of tuna. Like, it was just like (laughs) one of those like, oh my God, get everything. What's left? And there (laughs) there was no toilet paper. So it was just like, baby wipes and, you know, tissues and, I don't know, paper towels, party napkins. Oh it was like gosh. this whole thing. And uh, we just grabbed everything we could possibly grab. <laughs> well, nice. I remember I was on a ski trip when the pandemic started. And I remember we got dropped off in front of a grocery store and no frills. And yeah. we looked inside and we saw that the toilet paper aisle was totally vacant and we hadn't seen the news articles or we had been skiing, like nobody, we, we hadn't really yeah. been paying attention. And yeah. yeah, it was just so, so surreal. But now for an artist, sometimes being locked down for an extended period of time can be like a very creative process or also not. What has it been like for you in terms of songwriting and overall creativity? Um, definitely um, being on my own has been um, therapeutic and it's also been, I mean, it's been a great time to reflect, which has helped with songwriting uh, because you really can't escape yourself. So you have to to really just um, zone in on your emotions and what you're dealing with uh, and what the world's dealing with. So it's definitely inspiring for, in a weird way, way um writing the writing process has been interesting i should say in the last uh few months 100 percent. do you have do you have a different do you have like a routine as to write like do you are you a person that writes every day do you wake up in the morning do you have a routine or is it more spontaneous uh sorry spontaneous to kind of the environment you're in or just you know if the mood strikes you right in a sense Uh, it was spontaneous for a while. Um, but recently I've been, um, really focused on, uh, writing this album. So I have like, it's scheduled in. (laughs) So it's like, you have a writing session today at 11 AM. It's like, okay, I better get some inspiration and, and have some coffee. And like, I don't know, I don't know, watch a sad movie and cry for an hour, you know, before getting into this. So no, I mean, right now it's not really spontaneous. It's, it's pretty like focused in and, 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 um, I have a schedule, but for a while it was when I wasn't working on the album, it was just kind of whenever I felt the the desire to, you know, glass of wine and I get emo and, <laughs> I sit by the piano, uh, you know. So. Well, have you been, I got to ask, because I've been doing this and I'm I'm curious on everyone else's experience, but have you been writing over Zoom? Have you been doing like internet collaborations? Yeah, the internet collabos are, are real and they're um, constant. Uh, it's the new way, you know, when when this all happened with COVID and we were locked down, like, I had to like really uh, uh, put together 
a working studio for myself, like a little writing room because I had to get the right monitors and I really focused on getting the right microphone. Jim Johnson, who I've been working with for a while, he, he kind of set me up with Ableton and, um, you know, the mic that I use, uh, the SM7 and just like really setting me up because yeah. that is the new way truly, uh, to be able to do it at home. So I did that. And then yes, a ton of zoom sessions. I mean, when we did, um, lean on me for artists can, that was all remote. I mean, we recorded all remotely. So you had to have gear. And I was so thankful when we did that, that I had the gear to do it. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I've talked to Danny Reiner about Artist Can. I've also talked to Tyler Shaw, and I'm glad to kind of complete the cycle and discuss it with you. Uh, that that song was absolutely amazing. It continues to be a really Thank great you. thing for COVID, bringing uh, donations in. All the royalties of the song are going towards uh, relief for COVID nineteen. Mm-hmm. What was it like to Canadian work on Canadian Red this? Cross? Yeah, Canadian Red Cross. I'm so mm-hmm. sorry, uh, oh, and. I mean, what was it like to work on on such a project, like such a grand scale project and the concept behind it? Uh, it, it was interesting how it came about because um, I've worked with Danny for many, many years. I've known Danny for a long time. And uh, he had mentioned it and I was like, well, damn, I want to, what can I do to help put this together? And it just kind of formed there. It was Danny... Uh, Tyler Shaw and myself. And we just started making phone calls, honestly, and just, hey, you want to be a part of this? And 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 just kind of using our our years of being in the industry of uh knowing and and reaching out to people we've worked with over the years. Um, there are a lot of people we weren't able to put in the the track that we really had hoped to put on it. Uh, just for timing and whatnot didn't work out, but yeah, it was amazing to be a part of and and to put together. And I, we can't believe that we were able to do it. You know, we were like, okay, we're gonna get, you know, Michael Bublé, and we're gonna get. I never say his last name right. Bublé, Bublé, Bublé. <laughs> um, we're gonna get Michael Bublé, and we're gonna get Justin Bieber. We're like, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it, and. Dan Cantor helped so much with that. Like he, he was amazing with that. Um, getting Justin on there and, and, and Brian and a bunch of others that were like, Dan, you're the man. So uh, it worked out. It worked out beautifully. Well, it was also cool to see. I mean, the list of uh, contributors to the project is, is massive. And I, I did a podcast where I, I said all the names and I think it was about a four minute segment of going through everyone who appeared on it, everyone who collaborated on it. I will say too, as as you did have, you know, Justin Bieber on it and Michael Bublé, there were also curveballs like Getty Lee, who oh, yeah. you know, that was just so cool. And and it, you know, it's so interesting when I saw him, it's like, okay, I gotta watch this whole thing to see like who else is in there, you know? <laughs> who else is in this thing? Uh yeah, I mean it's we tried to have a big range of artists and um, different genres, uh, different uh, generations. You know, I thought I think that's really important. But um, and then John Levine, who's an amazing producer and writer, who produced the track, and uh, he brought Avril. And you know, there are so many different types of artists on there, and it's it's pretty fabulous. Pretty oh, fabulous. Yeah. When I watch. I, I still get kind of choked up. I'm like, how do we do this? This is crazy. Well, and then the fact that it debuted across, it was multi-channel, multi-organization in the sense that it was mm-hmm. kind of like when the 2010 Olympics happened where it was broadcasted on all the networks. It's, I mean, that alone is a feat in itself. And especially in this day and age, you can do whatever you want, but it's all about getting it out there. And the the rollout was just it was oh. it was an incredible feat in itself. Yeah, the rollout was amazing, um, and we had a like a seriously tight timeline, you know, because um, we had to premiere it on that rollout. We were just 
Danny was just like, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? And we're just trying to keep our cool. And I, I remember uh, for my video, I was like, I'm so hard on myself. Uh, so I'm like, I don't know, like, can I, maybe I should shoot it again. I shot it so many times. Like it's, I'm just, I'm just that person. I'm like that on Instagram. I'm like that with everything. Like I'm so like, I'll sit with a photo for like hours and write one caption and then be like, no, 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 no. And then like, it'll, it'll be like a long caption and then I'll be like, no, no, no. And then like an hour later, I'll be like, I'll just write good day. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, uh Oh, it's torturous. I understand. I do a weekly podcast. It's it's like some of the biggest things take the least amount. Like I like this conversation is so fluid, but when I make the Instagram post for yeah. it, when it's out, I'll be up until two in the morning. And for no reason. I don't know what that is. It's the it's I don't know. It's just so it's like the pressure of like, I just want this to be great. I just want this to be right. Um yeah. I wish I had that, like that the ability to just um post it and walk away from it, you know, like just yeah. like, Pow! you know, but it's, it's really hard. It's really hard. You, you grew up, you were born and raised in Toronto and yeah. well, I know that you, well, I was born in Scarborough. You were born in Scarborough. Okay. Whereabouts in Scarborough? Ah, well, I traveled so much. Um, I was born at Scarborough General Hospital. Ooh. Yeah, that I do know. And um, we lived, when I was like in kindergarten, I think we lived in like Kingston Road in Galloway. Galloway, yeah. Kingston Road in Galloway. And then um, from there we moved to, I believe, Morningside and Sewell's. Okay. Or Morningside and something. Yeah. Well, also I wanted to ask with regards to songwriting, because I know that you did, you know, write your own songs, record your own songs, put out like your own demos, which got you a lot of attention. But when was the uh, element of music? Like, when did you first get interested in it? You know, it's weird. Um, I don't really know when it happened, but I have always loved music. I mean, who? doesn't love music. I actually met one person my whole life that actually said, I don't listen to music and it, it'll stay with me forever. Psycho. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it'll stay with me forever. Uh, but I, I think it was just something that truly saved me and kept me um, in a very, it kept me sane as a kid. Um, I had a lot of music in my house. My mom played tons of records from Lionel Richie to Depeche Mode to Phil Collins. She played a lot. She loved music so much. Um, and my sister played a ton of music in, in her room, like right. Guns N' Roses and Kurt Cobain and then Boys to Men when she was going through a breakup. Um, and I, I and and Michael Jackson was a huge one in our home, um, and Janet, uh, and I just uh, I gravitated towards it. Always knew I wanted to be an artist. You know, even when I was in um, elementary school, they would ask you, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they'd go through everybody and. And I'd be like, I want to be a recording artist. And my teacher was like, well, what's your plan B? And oh. yeah, and I was like, yep, nope. I don't have a plan B. I've never had a plan B since I was a kid. That's all I ever wanted was to be a recording artist. So how many siblings do you have? I have two younger brothers and an older sister. With having, so I'm the eldest, so I think that a lot of the music that I got or understood growing up or was passed through were with my friends that had older siblings. And that's yeah. how, you know, you said gun, Guns N' Roses. I remember Pearl Jam was another one that I would yeah. never have discovered. Even like 
Green Day to a certain extent, like Green right. Day, Green Day Mach One. Right. Uh, it's so weird. Green Day is a weird one because people of like multi generations got into music because of Green Day because American Idiot came out after they had done like seven albums in a sense. Uh-huh. But having an older sister, I imagine that that's a, a huge passage to just discovering a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of music, a lot of just influence. Was it was it helpful to have someone that was that having someone in their bedroom listening to things, just turning you on to new music? Most definitely, because um, to me, it was like I, I heard the sounds because she wouldn't let me in her room. So <laughs> like I heard the sounds through the door, like, oh, my God. But that makes it more exciting. Yeah, like you just hear Axel holding that last note, like, ha, you know, and you're like, what is that? You know, and it was just so cool. And the re- the re- uh, the rebellion and, and like just, you know, she was she, just to see how she dressed. And I personally think I dress cooler than her, but, you know, but um, I was just so uh, she was so rebellious. And I loved that. And uh, so, yeah, I got a lot of music that way. It's so funny because I asked my mom now, I'm like, why didn't you ever play the Beatles? I didn't, I didn't get to hear the Beatles until I was 16 years old. My mom oh. never played the Beatles record. And it kind of bothers me because I feel like she kept like a, a gem from me for so long. And I asked her, and she's like, well, that's what my, that's what my mother played. It's like, I don't right. care. I don't care. Like, you should have turned me on to that. So I remember when I heard my first, the first Beatles record uh, when I was 16 and, and it blew my mind. And then, um, which album? I think it was Abbey Road. Okay. So, okay. Uh, or maybe I'm not sure which one it was. It was like a loose disc and I, uh, I think it was a compilation. It might've been a compilation. I'm not sure, but it was, I just remember hearing it in a car and being like, holy shit. Um, that changed me. And then the doors changed me uh, fully too. But growing up, the one, the one genre or the one huge musical influence to me that nobody turned me on to that I just found myself was um, music theater. And right. Judy Garland was, is, is still one of my... I, I don't know. Every time I see her, I just, I don't know, my heart breaks. I love Judy Garland. What kind of stuff did, was this like uh, movies seeing as a child that you just started to notice her? Um, yeah, as a child. I mean, everybody like knows Wizard of Oz. And of course, that was my first yeah. film that I saw with her in it. But it wasn't that. It was like... Yeah, she was amazing in that, but there was there was so much more um, that I connected to. So after that, I like researched her. I did um, projects on her, and I was obsessed with her. Um, and even as an adult, like I have such a respect for her and Liza and just that family. It's wild to think what they did at the time and how it still resonates to this day. Like it. The more I know an artist like Julie Judy Garland, the we get older and her body of work stays the same, but you just realize how hard she was working to pull it off and to be so elegant doing it. Yeah, and I think that I I there must be something that I relate to because she started so young and um had to find her way through an industry where that's all she knew. And that was her survival. And despite her, her situations with love and all that, this tragedy put her on stage and, and she smiled through it, you know? And I think there's something about that um, kind of artist and that talent that is, uh, that will never be forgotten. I mean, she was so young. You were very young, and I actually didn't realize this until about two days ago, that when you first started to, you know, uh, hit the scene, like, be on radio, 
become a success. You were really young, but what was it like? And when did you start writing your own music? It got me out of my home, which was a blessing. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was a dream come true, but I didn't really realize it, you know, because it, it did happen quite quickly when, it, when, when the machine started rolling, it did happen quite quickly. You know, even when I got signed, it was like, it was a, it was a private showcase. I was 17. It was a private showcase, downtown Toronto. And Lior uh, Cohen and Jeff Fenster flew in from New York early morning. Uh, Chris had set up the, the showcase for them. And I, I started singing Stupid Little Love Song in like 15, not even like 15 seconds or whatever the story is or three minutes into the song. I think the song is only three minutes, so it's, it's got to be shorter than that. But uh, they were ready to, to sign me, you know? And Lior signed me based on wrong lyrics too. It was a stupid love song. He thought it was a stupid little buzzsaw. He was like, I love it. <laughs> I just love it. That's and, awesome. Um, <laughs> it happened so quick that like, I remember walking out of the venue and they're like, you know, you're, you're about to get signed. Your dreams are about. And I was like, that's awesome. And then I, I, I like turned my head to the right and saw like a Marilyn Monroe photo. And I was like, oh my God, I want that. Like I just, I wasn't, in the moment and I didn't understand what was going on um, until it really started going on. And uh, I had been writing forever that I, I started writing poetry when I was like 12, 13. And then I was writing for local bands, local boy bands. Um, and then How did you I, get into that? The, the writing for local boy, ba boy yeah. bands? <laughs> Speaker's Corner. No way. Like, you just went, yeah. you went on Speaker's Corner? No, these boy, this boy band went on Speaker's Corner. And um, I saw them and I was like, oh my God, they're so cute. And uh, <laughs> that was my main, I was like, they're cute. I want to write for them. Wow. And so, yeah. And so I, you know how they, leave the information at the bottom, speaker's corner, like reach out yeah. to us. So we had a, you remember the old school phones that like you could, like there yeah. were like home phones, but you could like, literally you could write messages through, you go on the internet. It was like a little tiny screen on these home phones. Oh yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. There were the, yeah. And I emailed them on my, from this phone, I guess. And they were like, yeah, we'd love to. They like, came to our house in Scarborough, my house in Scarborough, to my mom's house. And uh, I played them this song. It was called Baby It's You. <laughs> it was so, it's like, I was like 15, Baby It's You. Um, and yeah, they, they loved it and they recorded it and everything. They took the song and they recorded it at a Whoa. studio. Oh, that, I mean, that's gotta be, I, when that happened to me, I was like 25 and it was still one of my favorite days of all time. To be 15, I mean, that's got to be surreal that people are taking you seriously as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, which is weird because I just thought they were cute. <laughs> I wasn't, I, I was, I've been boy crazy since I was young. So I um, was like, well, they're no Hanson, but. <laughs> and they're no in sync, but I'll take them. Well, that's fantastic. It, when did you, along the way, when did you find your voice, or when did you start writing songs for you? Um, around sixteen, I started writing. I mean, I co-wrote the record with uh, Jay Levine and James McCollum, um, which Prozac, oh, uh, right. the band Prozac that's who I wrote the first album with. And, um, and, and Jay really got me, um, focused on writing because I, I was kind of insecure with it. And I had written a song called rainbow that was dedicated. It's on the album as a bonus track. And it's actually dedicated to Judy Garland. It's about Judy Garland. Um, and, um, I was very insecure to play that for him. And uh, he was like, no, you, you got some chops. And so we just, he really, really, really wanted me to 
to co-write my first album. It was very important and I'm so happy I did. Well, I mean, it was a, I, so at the time that your first song started to hit the radio, I was in, you know, my parents' basement playing guitar with my friends and finding our form. When you did get signed, when this whirlwind happened, what was it like to hear, like just to hear yourself being a success, even if you didn't know it, but, but to turn on the radio and hear your song? It's still weird. Or songs, not even song, but you had songs. Like you were, you were, uh, you hit the Canadian airwaves by a storm, which was, which was wild and amazing. And and everyone knew who you were too. Yeah. I mean, it's still weird to hear my voice on radio when it gets played. It's still kind of like, (laughs) yeah. Like, yeah, he's listening to this. Um, but it's a dream come to, like seriously, it's I mean as cheesy as that might sound, it is really a dream that has come true for me. Um I don't know what I would have done without without music. And I don't know what I would have done without the team that I've had that helped those dreams happen. Yeah. Truly. So every time I hear myself, there's so much um, that goes into that. And when I hear it, I, I think about, again, this might sound kind of cheesy, but I think about the journey. I think about um, the people involved, the people that believed in the song. It's not just like listening to the song and being like, this song is sick, you know, or like, can't believe this song is out. It's like, you take a, a moment to really appreciate appreciate after the songs came out i imagine that you you started touring and you probably started in in uh in canada but what was it like to to hit the road and just start you know performing constantly well that was the main thing was to put me on the road because to really understand the project and to understand me as an artist it was you needed to see it visually and that was very important to uh the label and and to my team as well, management, was that you put her on the road, see the live show. Because, you know, as as it goes, you know, uh, I am a black woman that, or a black girl. At that point, I was a girl. I'm a woman now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, doing doing this music and the voice doesn't match the look, you know? And so... You know, naturally, when you heard my voice, a lot, you know, people always thought like, oh, she's, you know, she's a white girl. And and they see me and they're like, either like, damn, or like, whoa, <laughs> you know, so it, it mixed reviews on that at the beginning. So did that affect you? Being live, did that affect me? Yeah. Of course. Of course. Of course. Because I didn't, you know... I was just doing what I, what I, what I know. And, and my voice and the way I sing is honestly just years probably of listening to so, uh, so many different artists and genres. And that's just what came out of me, you know? Um, But when I first started, it was like, uh, I was working with a Canadian label and they kind of like, she's like Brandy Spears. She's black, but she's, she's pop, you know, Brandy Spears. And I, I didn't want to be categorized like that. Like, I just was like, I'm me and, and I don't make any sense and that's fine. You know, I'm different. Well, I imagine that would have been hard to articulate though. As, uh, not to say that like you weren't a smart person at 17, but just right. to have other people start. Because everyone wants to put something in a box. And, sure. and it must have been really hard because instead of saying, I don't know. I don't know. They said, "Oh, here's the box. Let's put you in this." And then you're you're in a box or or they're presenting you with something, an idea, an an option that you don't agree with. Yeah. I mean, I walked away from that label that called me Brandy Spears. Um and that is a lot of that is because, you know, 
you know, you're demoing, you're doing different types of songs. You're, you're, you're trying to figure out who you are clearly um, when you first start out and they had an idea and I was in the studio working with this guy, Dave Hodge and Dave Hodge and like a well, it's called Wellesley studios downtown. Mm -hmm. And I was um, just singing this like really kind of pop R and B song, like, because that's what they wanted me to record. And Jay and James heard me next door. They had, were doing a session for Prozac and they were like, we need a singer. Um, and they heard my voice and they're like, can we use her for a second for this? Can we like have her demo this song? They had just met me. They didn't, you know, knew nothing about me. And I was like, shit. Yeah. Of course. I'd love to. So I went in, I started singing and it was like a, it was like a pop punk song. Um, I think it was called get a clue. It was like really like, whimsical and prozac -y. Yeah. And uh, I sang it and, and Jay was like, what are you doing? Like, why are you singing that music? That's not your voice, you know? Like, you clearly hear that, right? And I was like, yeah, like, I've been trying to explain that to them. Like, I love rock and roll. I love guitars, you know? I, I, yeah, thank you. And And he was like, well, look, like, I'll make the record you want to make, you know, and it might not do anything. <laughs> I can't promise you anything, but you'll, you'll make a album that you're happy with and proud of. And that's how it started. That's amazing. And I, I cut you off with regards to live and, but I, I, that's fine. I with what you were saying, you're, um, but what I, as, as you were on the road touring, I imagine that even though they put you out, on the road to define you to an audience, the the repetition or the 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 opportunity to play, you know, every night or every second night that must have been great to to like hone hone the skill and hone the chops. And it was probably amazing to do it in front of an audience instead of the floor. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> like that's gonna be um, crazy. Like you kind of yeah. didn't get a chance, or maybe not much of a chance to 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 do it when no one was watching. Yeah, like I went to music theater high school, so I kind of learned how to. Okay, that, that, that. I was yeah, I was taught how to like the show must go on. Doesn't matter if you're throwing up, you better get on stage. So I was taught uh, discipline really nice. young. Um, and you just kind of like da da da. I'm here, you know, just by anything. So um, regardless of anything, whatever. So yeah, I was there, and I uh, music theater helped me a lot um, with that aspect and I did play some like Java house like coffee shops with Dan Cantor yeah. um at the beginning because Dan's been a part of my story before I was even really signed and um and then we did like little little bars you know like where I shouldn't even have been in bars because you know I was too young to even be in there like so bad but like <laughs> the dungeon in oshawa yes like, like pre, little, pre or post chain fence yeah like little 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 places and then um where there's like 20 people Woo! yeah that was great you know like five claps turn back around they drink their Whatever yeah. condo is now built on top of the dungeon is haunted oh my god for real <laughs> I would not want to live there. Um, so yeah, and then it turned into I did a, uh, a Camplify tour where it was just um, artists playing in the U.S. like for camps, literally. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was called the Camplify tour, and then and then all of a sudden I was on tour with Justin Timberlake in Europe. So it was like it went from that to. What was it like being on the Justified tour? It was amazing <laughs> it had to have been it was amazing oh, I so cool. grew up in love with Justin Timberlake like it was not even like I used to like sit in high school and just be like one day I was telling my friends like one day Justin Timberlake is going to know me and they're like you crazy you crazy he ain't ever gonna know you um I was like oh yeah watch and see 
And uh, every concert I went to, to NSYNC, I get a little closer to the front stage, cry. <sighs> um, and then uh, he introduced my video on TRL. And, and it's funny, he introduced Take Me Away, which not, I don't think I've ever said this in an interview, but Take Me Away is about Justin Timberlake. <laughs> no way. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. My gosh. Yeah. And I wrote that song because I used to have his posters on my wall, and it talks about that, like being a daydreamer and like just wanting him to take me away and like not in some creepy way, but just like almost like I was just like, oh my God, because I, I, I my child, like my teenagehood was so crazy and dramatic and just too much for me to handle. So I used to look at my posters and be like, oh my God, one day I'm going to live in this fantasy world and da, da, da. And it made me happy to like have my posters on my wall. And, um, and the, and the blue eyes thing, it's about Justin Timberlake. And so, uh, when he brought me on tour, I was like, dude, he totally took me away. <laughs> oh man. Don't you feel validated for, for being so reckless to your friends? <laughs> Because to say right? that, like, you know, th- it's uh, it's so amazing that you did because it totally came true. Like, you you set your intent in a sense. Yeah, it's like manifesting is really real. Um, but it's also you can almost seem a little out of your mind a little bit because I'm sure they thought I was absolutely insane. You know, like, yeah. I'm drunk. My uncles hand me down clothes. We're poor as hell. I'm walking around with two buns on my head and I'm, you know, beat up shoes and backpack. And I'm like, one day, you know, like I'm like looking at them like one day, guys. They're just like, she crazy. Oh, but it's but it's so cool because because you exactly did that. I mean, what yeah. a it's like the the you know how they say that like dumb poster that they'd have in elementary school, like shoot for the moon. And you'll land amongst the stars. Yeah. You kind of hit a bullseye on that one. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you. So, and I mean, the experience of, of working with such a huge artist. I just watched a documentary on the making of Justified, which is on YouTube, which was which was really interesting. That's the tour I'm on. And that's tour. that's so cool that you were part of it and you got to see it in in real time because mm-hmm. I mean that album for Justin Timberlake was was paramount. That was that was like you know that was you know, we talked about the Beatles earlier but that was kind of a Sgt. Pepper's moment for R&B and for Justin Timberlake and, right. and to have a to have a seat on on that rocket ship and also to to see him every night and to be able to kind of take what you're seeing and, and embody it and put it into your career. I mean, that must have been, I mean, that's just such an experience in its own. Yeah, it was the first really big tour I'd been a part of. And um, to see what goes into those tours, you know, is, is insane. It's crazy. I thought I have one regret though. I didn't get any merch. I should have got like a shirt or something. I didn't think about it. Oh, I was like in so a zone, funny. you know, just like, oh, you know. Well, you got to like you got to perform too and I mean, yeah, it's yeah. got to I mean that 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 must have been just surreal. Such an experience. It was. It was the first really big stage too. Like I that's the other thing I I, I was taught in uh music theater was to use the stage. Right. Use the stage, go everywhere, use the stage. And always, maybe it worked for me, I don't know, but the sing to the back of the room, you know, always perform to the back of the room. Yeah. Um, Big difference between a, a gymnasium and a, a, you know, a hockey arena, right. though. Because <laughs> you when you have a microphone, you're, you're, you know, you're projecting, you don't have to over project because there's a little mic on the stage, you know? Yeah. Um, which I learned the hard way because I'm always so loud and just, no. Nah. Um, but that was the first uh, big stage that I ever performed on. And I remember just going like, I felt like the Tasmanian devil. I was like, what do I do now? Do I go there? All the way to the right? Do I go all the way to the left? And he let me have like basically the full stage, you know, just not the walkway or whatever, runway or whatever. But like, 
I had the ability to run everywhere. And I was just like, I was like, I was let out of a cage and just let loose, like, like running around. Yeah. It was amazing. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, Fifi, honestly, I could talk to you all day long. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop us now because uh, if it's okay with you, I'd like to continue this uh, conversation one day in person, hopefully. Yeah, that'd but, be amazing. Yeah, thank thank you so much. I I gotta let you know that your name has come up on this podcast. I've done a hundred and your hundred and twenty five episodes, and your name has probably come up uh, probably top five. Um, really on the podcast? Yeah, it's and and some of that is because we've had Danny Reiner on, who talks about you a lot, and we just yeah. had Dan Cantor on, so he talked about his experience on touring with you. So. I'm really glad we had you on kind of in this um, close quarters so that we can kind of build up your story in the next couple of episodes for when this is released, which is really great. I would love that. I love talking to you. Oh, thanks, Fifi. Likewise. Well, I want to ask, I know you, you've you hinted at the fact that you're working on a new album right now. Yes. And mm-hmm. when it when it is out, whenever that is, and let's say that the pandemic is is not a part of our equation when that happens. Uh, what are you looking forward to? What's what would you like to do? What's what's next for you? Tour. I want to tour. I love waking up in a new city. You know, the smell of a new city and and going and getting coffee and and going into the venue and doing sound check and you know, uh, meeting new people and connecting with the fans. That's what I'm excited about. Oh, amazing. Thanks so much. This is so good. I was looking forward to this. Uh, I was really looking forward to this, and uh, this was so much fun. Thank you so much. Yay. All right, great. Well, enjoy Nashville. I, uh, I will. I hope you have a great time, and hope to see you in Toronto sometime soon. Yes. Yeah, talk soon. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Fifi. Bye. Thank you. I'd like to thank Fifi for being on the podcast. Again, it was a fantastic conversation. I I was, I got into like all, I felt like we got into like the nitty gritty of uh, what makes her and who she is and especially her early story. And I look forward to bringing you more of Fifi's story in the future. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for a guest you'd like to hear on the podcast, send us an email, allaboutthesongpodcast at gmail.com. Our website to check out past episodes is www.allaboutthesongpodcast.com. Check out our YouTube page, the Sounds Like Songs Network. Be sure to subscribe, hit the notification button, leave a comment. And if you could do so on the audio side too, we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, we are there. I also found that when I did the audio podcast, I was way more open about you know what I was up to, and to be quite honest, it's nothing. I am bored out of my mind, but there are some musical opportunities coming up soon. I, I'm a performing member in the band Kadima, and I think we have some live streams coming up in March. When we get closer to it, I will let you all know. But for now, for Fifi Dobson, I am Michael Magdanell. Episode 123 is in the books. We'll see you next Tuesday.